Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is a teaching session presented jointly by the FRCS Mentor Group and Orthopedic Research UK. I'm Firas Arnaud and will be modulating the session. And to help me here, there are members of the Mentor Group, uh, Shuan and Abdullah, and as well as Ruth, who is the Head of Education from uh, ORUK. The speaker is Gavin Spence, and he's teaching us tonight about Blount disease. Gavin is a consultant pediatric orthopedic surgeon at Burjil Hospital in Dubai. He's, he has clinical interest in limb deformity correction, and he has been a consultant prior to this current position. He's been a consultant in Great Ormond Street Hospital for Children in London. He's been, he has particular interest in teaching, and he's been awarded Trainer of the Year by the British Orthopedic Trainee Association in 2019. And a lot to talk about uh, Gavin uh, uh, as well. The session will include basically, as you can see, a lecture presentation. Please pay attention very well because there'll be polling questions afterwards. There'll be three questions we'll ask you to answer and we'll give you the right answers to those, but we'll be very interested to um, uh, see if you pick the right answer from the presentation. We'll have an opportunity to ask questions. So if you hover your mouse uh, at the bottom of the screen, you will find a chat box. If you click on the chat box, uh, it will open a, a chatting um, function where you can post your questions and we will present them to Gavin uh, when it's appropriate. If you really like to talk directly to Gavin or if you like to take part in the afterwards um, hot seat Viva, Viva session, they will ask you to raise the hand symbol, which is located under the participants list. It's a blue symbol. And we know that you are interested in taking part in Viva. These are served on first come, first served basis. So if you're interested, we'll ask you to express your interest as early as possible. Gavin has prepared very interesting questions, Viva questions that are exam specific and relevant, directly relevant to the FRCS exam. And you'll be given detailed uh, constructional feedback afterwards. So I, I urge you to make the best out of this opportunity. So it's quite an interactive session um, uh, with the, obviously the limitations that we know of. Um, we ask you all, please give us feedback at the end. Uh, obviously, we use this feedback uh, for our own development and to see how we can do better. And um, uh, Ruth, um, the head of education from ORUK, has been in touch with you and will be again in touch with you about certificates and about uh, the feedback. If you guys miss any part of this for any reason, don't panic. This will be recorded and we will share the recording on the FRCS Mentor uh, channel and on the ORUK website. Um, and uh, just as you can see here, this is the link. There are, uh, there are a series of teaching webinars we're presenting with uh, collaboration with ORUK. And uh, there will be many to come. Um, next one in a couple of weeks, again on a Wednesday, um, teaching about uh, knee replacement. So, um, they can always access these on the webinar page on ORUK website. So without further ado, I will um, we'll leave you with uh, Mr. Spence. Great. Well, um, Faraz, thank you so much. Ruth, thanks very much for the invitation to present on this webinar. This is a new venture for me too. So I, I was very excited about getting the chance to do this. And um, just to an extent, a welcome to all the people joining wherever you happen to be locked down in the world today. Um, I hope you're going to find this, uh, this session useful. So just before we start the session properly, just a few words about Orthopaedic Research UK. Um, they, as you may know, are a charity based in the UK and their aim is really to improve orthopaedic knowledge. And it's, it's a two pronged approach, partly a research arm and partly an educational arm. Um, and my personal background with Orthopaedic Research UK goes back a long way, about 15, 16 years in fact. When I first got in touch with them, they helped out with funding some research that I was doing, which uh, to cut a very long story short, I was really desperate for the cash at the time 
because um, the charity that was going to fund me had gone bust. So uh, Orthopaedic Research UK really helped me out and I think I was in fact their first research fellow. So I've had a long uh, and very happy relationship with them and now I continue mainly on the educational side with them and um, they're a fantastic organisation. They're great people to work with. I, I count them on, amongst my friends. So good for Orthopaedic Research UK. So um, if paediatrics is your bag or if indeed it's not your bag and it's something that you are concerned about particularly for your exam we have a seminar coming up in January it's a two-day course this is the latest iteration of a number of courses that we've run with Orthopaedic Research UK um, it's a two-day course where we really try and plug knowledge particularly for people whose experience of paediatric orthopaedics is limited we try and focus in on those areas that people struggle with we pepper it full of the sort of information that's often not in the books and which are top tips for passing the exam. Um, the feedback from the last course was really good. So if you're interested in that course, you can get details on the Orthopaedic Research UK website, or you can use your phone and you can scan that QR code you can see in the bottom right. Um, there's also textbooks, revision textbooks available from Orthopaedic Research UK's website or from Amazon. Um, these are two of the really popular sort of go-to textbooks for revising for the exam. And finally, if you want to um, donate and support the excellent work that Orthopaedic Research UK do, you can do that through their website too, or by scanning that QR code. Okay, that is the marketing over. Let's get on with the presentation. So this is on Blount disease. Blount disease is a really terrific topic, but um, I don't want you to get things out of proportion. So it is actually a cause of genuvarum, but it is not going to be the commonest cause of bow legs that you see in your clinic. So don't go away from this presentation diagnosing Blount disease in every kid you see, because that's not going to be the cause. How many of the kids that you see in your clinic have Blount disease? Well, that really depends on where you live in the world, because the incidence of Blount disease varies according to population. And it also depends on whether you're in a tertiary setup or a secondary setup or, or whatever it is. But suffice to say, it's a pretty small number. So even countries which have populations which are prone to Blount disease don't report large prevalences. So in the United States, it's less than 1%. And in South Africa, um, less than 0.1%. So small numbers, okay? So... Famously, it's a disease that is bimodal. It has two age groups in which a condition called Blount disease occurs, a condition of progressive bow legs, genuvarum. Whether these are two separate conditions or, or whether they represent part, part of the same pathology is open to debate, but they definitely occur in two age groups. And traditionally, those have been called the infantile age group and the adolescent. And as you can see from in the slide I've drawn there. The infantile group is, is the commonest one. The literature though gets a little bit confusing because it sometimes talks about juvenile. So, so a juvenile Blount disease is, is thought to be uh, that form of bow legs which occurs after the age of about four. But there's a lot of debate about it. There is a feeling that probably most quotes juvenile cases are in fact infantile cases that were never picked up in the early years. So it's not a term I'm going to use in this talk, and it's, it's not a term that I think is particularly helpful. In fact, if I had my way, we'd drop the terms adolescent and infantile, and we talk about Blount disease as either being early onset or late onset. And the reason why I, I think that's helpful, well, partly it kind of does what it says on the tin. It makes it very clear what we're talking about here. But perhaps more importantly, you have to remember that infantile Blount disease is a recurrent disease, as we're going to discuss that in some detail over the next few slides. So what that means is when you see an adolescent, it might be that they have the adolescent form of Blount disease, but equally, in fact, probably more likely, they are adolescents who have a recurrent form of the infantile disease. I hope that makes some sense. So adolescents could have one of those two um, scenarios which have led them to have a bow leg. So you can see the terminology is all getting rather confusing here. Um, 
early onset, late onset, some authors use and they, and they mean something completely different by it. Some authors use late onset as meaning after four years. So it's tricky. So what we're going to do to stick with the rest of this presentation, we're going to talk about good old fashioned infantile blounts and adolescent blounts. So let's start with the most common, which is infantile blounts. So what do all these kids have in common? Well, it's been known for some time that blount disease occurs pretty much in all races and all countries in the world, but it does seem to have a predilection for certain racial groups. So kids whose genetics hail from sub-Saharan Africa seem to be particularly prone to this condition. It's also a condition that tends to occur in kids who walked early and who are on the heavy side, although that second one is not universal, but quite a lot of these kids uh, are over the 95th centile in terms of weight for age. So heavy early walkers. And that's going to be important in the pathogenesis as we'll discuss on the next slide. In infantile blount disease, it's generally girls more than boys. And there's some really interesting literature on vitamin D deficiency in this condition. So of course, vitamin D deficiency can cause bow legs anyway by nutritional rickets, but that's a very different condition. Radiologically, it's a completely different condition. But there have been some papers suggesting that perhaps children with blount disease also have a vitamin D deficiency and others that say, actually, they know more vitamin D deficient than most of the rest of the population. So the literature is a little bit unclear on that. But ultimately, the primary pathology here is a premature physeal failure, physeal closure. So to any pediatric orthopedic surgeon, that is immediately ringing, ringing a whole load of alarm bells. Whenever you've got a condition occurring in young children that's starting to close their physis up, you know you've got a bit of a headache coming. You've got a condition that you're going to find very hard to cure and which you're going to be seeing a lot of these patients for. So the primary problem, if you like, is generally thought to be tibia vara, genuvarum, bow legs. But bear in mind, this is actually a three-dimensional deformity. And they also have axial deformity in the form of um, in tibial intorsion and also a sagittal plane deformity. So uh, anticavatum or procavatum of the tibia. It looks more like a, a sort of more acute posterior tibial slope. So the pathogenesis in infantile blount disease, these, these poor kids really get a, a bit of a double whammy, if you like. So they are kids who are walking early and therefore they tend to walk at a stage in their lives when they're prone to having genuvarum anyway. So that means that their mechanical axis is missing the center of their knee. It's going really missing the knee entirely. So all of their considerable body weight, because they're normally over the 95th centile, is coming down inside the knee, causing compression on the medial side of the growth plate just here. And well, what do we know what happens to growth plates that get compressed? We know from the Heuter Volkmann principle that that tends to inhibit growth, not just on the medial aspect, but in the posterior medial aspect, which presumably explains the fact that it's a three dimensional deformity. So that's the theory about how Blount disease actually develops. And if you look at the evidence from histology, that really kind of backs it up because we have histological specimens from kids who've had surgery for infantile blount disease. And you'll see that nice columnar arrangement that you, you will learn about for the basic sciences of the physis has been disrupted. Eventually, physeal bars forms, and there's a lack of ossification both in the epiphysis and the metaphysis. So all of that's rather suggestive of a failure of the growth plate. But the growth plate's not your only problem. These knees, I don't know if you can see on this x-ray, but this knee is subtly subluxated towards the lateral side. So it's the lateral structures, particularly the lateral collateral ligament that gets attenuated in this condition. And some children have a lateral thrust, which is that sort of sudden jerking appearance whenever they take a step. So that's what's going on pathology wise in Blount disease. Now I mentioned this, this problem with ossification. So if you look at the x-ray here on the left of the screen, it looks rather alarming, doesn't it? It looks like there's really nothing there on the medial side of the joint. But in the MRI it shows something slightly different. You can see, in fact, the epiphysis is present, but it just has, there's been a failure there of ossification. So sometimes the x-rays look rather more alarming than the reality would suggest because of deficient ossification. 
Okay, so that's the basic sciences of infantile blount disease. That's what we think is going on in this condition. But this is what comes into your clinic. You get a kid like this, whose dad's worried about him. He's got bow legs. Somebody else has told him that they'd seen a kid like that before that who got terrible bow legs and he needs to have treatment. So what are you gonna do? Well, as with any orthopedic condition, we start with the history. And some of the registrars who train with me know that one, one of my things is I, when you get to the stage of your FRCS exam or more advanced clinical practice, you don't have time to do the medical student thing and ask a hundred questions. You just imagine it's like the game of hangman and you're only allowed to ask a limited number of questions. Let's say I only let you ask three questions of this family in order to get to a diagnosis. So the first question you'd want to know about this kid is, well, how old is he? Because it can be normal to have bow legs. It all depends on your age. Remember this graph here? This is the Selenius curve. If you haven't seen this graph before, you need to see it because this is probably the most important curve in pediatric orthopedics. It shows how the um, change from varus to valgus changes with age. So this is how the coronal plane alignment changes. What I'm showing you here is quite a simple graph. It just shows the mean. So you can see here, if that child is two years or less, then he's got every reason to have bow legs. Incidentally, it also shows why early walkers who are kind of up here on the graph are more prone to getting Blount disease, right? But if that kid is over two, and particularly if he's getting down to three, well, he should have genuvalgum. So age is a really important uh, question to ask because that will tell you whether this is physiological or if he's moving into the pathological range. What else might you ask to back up the diagnosis? Well, that's one of your next questions. Your hangman questions might be, did he walk very early? Because that's going to be suggestive. You'll, you might ask questions or it might be on your examination as to whether this is a heavy child. And of course, you might want to ask, if it's not obvious, what, what his, what his um, potential genetic makeup might be from his, from his racial background. We're normally taught, aren't we, that, that unilateral disease is a sign of pathology and bilateral disease usually means physiological. Unfortunately, that doesn't really work in uh, infantile Blount's disease, which is often a bilateral condition. So you're going to need a little bit of help here. You're going to need to phone a friend and the friend you're going to need to phone is a radiographer. So if you're concerned from any of these questions that this could be a case of Blount disease, radiographs going to help you out. So if you're lucky, you're going to get a radiograph like this. So this shows the typical radiological features of infantile Blount disease. The real giveaway is this beaking here of the medial part of the metaphysis on the affected side, on this patient's left side. So a combination of genuvarum, beaking, lateral subluxation. There's nothing else this can be really. I don't think, with, with one possible exception, I don't think I've seen a kid have anything other than Blount disease who looked like this. The exception was a child who had had meningococcal disease as, a, as a, an infant and had had various skin lesions. So it's possible that he had a medial growth arrest due to meningococcal disease. Basically, it's a giveaway. That's what Blount disease looks like. It can't be a chondroplasia. It can't be um, X-linked hyperphosphatemic rickets or any of the other weird causes of genuvarum. That's Blount disease. So that would be nice to get. But that's not what you get. What you get is this. You get a child with such bow legs you could drive a bus through that and extremely worried parents. And you're looking at the x-ray and you're thinking, well, I don't know, is that beaking or is that normal? And then you think, well, was the film rotated? Would it, or should I repeat it? So you're going to need some way really to, to try and distinguish between physiological genuvarum and pathological genuvarum due to Blount disease. So this is where you're going to have to get your measuring tools out because there is something here to help us. And this is uh, an angle described by two authors, Drennan and Levine, back in the 1980s. So they described an angle, and I'm going to show you now how to calculate this angle, which is said to distinguish between Blount disease and physiological genuvarum. So the first thing you do is draw a line connecting the most extreme points of the metaphyseal flare, like that. The next line you draw 
has to, if you like, describe the long axis of the tibia. So it's a bit difficult because the tibia is a little bit curved on its sides, but do the best you can and you draw a line that describes the center. You draw a perpendicular to that and measure the angle between the two. And that is the metaphyseal diaphyseal angle. So actually what Levine and Drennan reported was a cutoff of 11 degrees. Lower than 11 degrees, physiological. Higher than 11 degrees, Blount disease. Perfect, very orthopedic, we love it. But I think most of us understand that measuring lines on x-rays is often much more nuanced than that. So the figures that I've actually highlighted on the slide here belong to a more, if you like, sophisticated study by Perry Schoenecker and his co-worker. And what they showed was, in fact, it depends on the age of the child. The older the child is, the more accurate these measurements become. But if you take a cutoff of above 16 degrees or below nine degrees, then you're gonna have, basically you're gonna be right 19 out of 20 cases. So in between nine degrees and 16 degrees, that's a gray area and we're not quite sure. So those patients certainly need to be followed up. You won't want to be discharging them. Even Schoenecker and his coworker pointed out that this angle that you can measure, the metaphyseal diaphyseal angle, is helpful, but it's by no means the be all and end all. So it helps you to make a diagnosis, but if there's any clinical doubt, then you should keep the patient under review. Incidentally, in case you're wondering, this patient that I showed you, he had physiological genuvarum. So that was what happened without treatment. The point I want to make is, the extent of the condition, the extent of the genuvarum is not a predictor of whether they have Blount disease or not. You can have really quite marked genuvarum from physiological disease, and indeed that's what that, this kid had. Okay, so while we're on the subject of x-rays, there is this rather complicated looking grading system for Blount disease developed by Anders Langerskold, who, who was a professor working in Helsinki in Finland who described uh, a cohort of Finnish children with Blount disease. And when you look at that classification, um, I kind of, I feel sorry for him really, because it, it seems to be a classification that gets a bit of a bad press. It, it's, people think it's not really that helpful necessarily in terms of determining treatment. But to be honest, Langenskold never intended it to be that. He just intended it to be a, a, a description of the natural history. So those stages that you see are correlated with the age of the child. So he made the point that you can't really diagnose those early stages before the age of one. And the later stage, stage six, not really before the age of nine, and the other stages occur between. He, he never really intended for this to be a classification used to determine treatment, but nevertheless, that is how most people use it now with provisos. So that's what I'm gonna to use too, just to walk you through the different treatments. And one stage I really want to draw your attention to is this one, stage number four, because that really marks the watershed moment at which things start to get really complicated. And you'll know it's stage number four, because if you look at this beaking here on the medial side of the tibia, it starts off as being a beak in stage one. In stage two, it starts to develop a defect within the beak. In stage three, that defect becomes a shelf and it's stage four when the epiphysis seems to slip into the shelf but before it's gone on to become a bifid type of epiphysis here so that's how you recognize stage four in fact studies show that um, inter uh, observer variability in in assigning langer's gold grading is actually quite good perhaps surprisingly so it's not so difficult to spot the stage four everything before stage four has one type of treatment and everything stage four onwards has another, as I'm about to explain. So let's talk about the early stages first. So these are the early stages and therefore children of relatively young age, probably between about the age of two and six. So leave aside this CAFO, this is an orthosis treatment for Blount disease. I'm gonna come back to that in the next slide, but just focus here on stage two and stage three. So the treatment for this, these stages are essentially tibial osteotomy. So the idea is to do a tibial osteotomy and realign it. Because you're having to do the osteotomy 
at a distant point from where the cora is, the cora is, is really up here in the physis, but you're forced to make your osteo osteotomy down here in the metaphysis because obviously you, you, you've got to go distal to where the growth plate is and distal to where the extensor mechanism is. Then you're going to have to include, because the osteotomy is at a separate place to the cora, then you're going to have to include some translation in this. Um, this is all to do with the niceties of deformity correction, which is not the focus of this talk. But if you understand about coras, you'll know what I mean. If you don't, just take it from me that you're going to have to involve some translation in, in this condition. Most people in infantile blount disease try to overcorrect a little. And then you'd better pray to the gods that those physial changes, that beaking and that physial arrest is going to, nature is going to sort it out for you. Langenskold actually said everything up to stage four was, re was reversible, but it seems that perhaps that was overly optimistic and that's not in everybody's experience, certainly not with a, with a non-white population. In an Afro-Caribbean population, certainly that doesn't appear to be the case. That seems to run a more aggressive course with the recurrence being more the, the uh, order of the day. However, I told you that stage four was an important stage to remember in the Langenskold classification. Well, now I'm going to tell you that age four is also important. There are quite a few studies that show that if you can get this tibial osteotomy done, not at the age of six, but before the age of four, then you'll reduce the chance of recurrence. So that's important to remember. I say reduce the chance of recurrence. You don't reduce it to zero. Even in this study in the JPO, which was, I, I think, a meta-analysis, recurrence was still 46%, but better than the 85% if you left it until after four. So that's how you treat the early stages. Now, what about this business of treating in orthoses? So that's said to be a way of treating the early stages of Blount disease. Well, I don't know. I don't know if those of you who have two and three year olds of your own, um, if you want to try and strap them into a contraption like this and expect them to cooperate with you, well, best of British luck to you. I, I'd suggest that's actually quite difficult to do. So these splints are rather impractical, I would say. In, if you look at the design on the right here, you can see that those knees are locked in extension. Now, there are designs which allow knee flexion, but I'm not quite sure I understand how something that allows knee flexion is going to exert three point. Um, pressure and correct the deformity and what are you supposed to do put them on in the daytime or nighttime or both um, and where exactly is this correction occurring not entirely clear I don't really see that the that the correction is necessarily going to be focused on the tibia which is where the problem is if it, it's going to be a correction it's presumably spread throughout a bit of the femur and probably part of the knee joint as well there isn't really any good evidence, probably for the, the reasons I've just listed, for them working. But nevertheless, people do use them and they are described in the book. I would argue, though, if you know that you can treat this condition with a tibial osteotomy and you can, as long as you get it done by the age of four, then you have a reasonable treatment um, up your sleeve, then, then probably it would be reasonable not to use splints at all. And that's been my practice. But uh, I know some people do use them, so that's why I'm mentioning them. So this is an example of tibial osteotomy. You see here what I mean about doing the osteotomy dist distant place here to where the actual problem is, which means that when you swing this segment across, there is inevitably translation, and that's what you want to see. So I used an external fixator for this. You don't have to. You could use internal fixation if you want. It doesn't really matter. But notice also that that uh, tibia has been swung into a little bit of valgus, so we've tried to overcorrect here a little bit. So this is the treatment for stage one, two, and three, and ideally done before the age of four, if you want to reduce the chance of recurrence. So what about the more advanced stages? Well, once you get to stage four, so this is the point at which that beak has become a shelf and the epiphysis has sort of collapsed into it, but before the epiphysis has turned into two separate bits then your treatment's going to involve osteotomy, but you're going to have to do something about the physis as well, or particularly the physial bar, because this sure as eggs are eggs is going to lead to a recurrence if you don't. So what, what is this physial management? Well, basically, you've got two options. One would be to take the physial bar away and leave the normal physis behind. So this picture shows... Uh, a central bar. Of course, the bar I'm talking about here is peripheral, so it's not the ideal picture. 
But anyway, this is one option to remove the sick piece of the physis and leave the healthy bit behind. A physiolysis, so-called. So you're doing this on the medial side of the tibia. Option number two is to use a drill and a curette to deliberately destroy the physis on the lateral side because you know the medial side's gone al already. So you're just trying to arrest the growth on the lateral side to stop the disease from coming back. Again, my apologies, this picture is for epiphysiodesis done uh, not for Blount disease, but for a leg length discrepancy, but it's the only picture I had. I just wanted to, so you don't need to put the drill all the way across to the medial side because the medial side's already arrested. You just need to do the lateral side. So that's a physiodesis. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, why on earth would you do this? This is much cooler. Here you go, you're taking away the problem and away you go. Why would you want to destroy the last bit of growth plate remaining? Well, I agree with you. In theory, that would be great. But theory is one thing and practice is another. The fact is, taking away that bit of sick physis is great in theory, but in practice, hasn't really been that successful. So in theory, it should work, but in practice, we often find recurrence after um, the physis has supposedly been released of its tether. You might say, well, I can add an eight plate on to the other side, onto the lateral side, to try and improve the chances of correction. But that's only really going to work if you have a very healthy physis on the medial side as well. So great in theory, not so great in practice. The lateral physiodesis, on the other hand, sure is effective at stopping the deformity from coming back. But, and it's a big but, you've now condemned that child to a leg length discrepancy. They're going to have a straight leg, but they're going to have a problem with discrepancy of, of length. Now, for my money, I, I would rather deal with that. I'd rather deal with a straight leg and a discrepancy, because there are lots of ways of treating that, than a bent leg that's been straightened and is coming back again. Serial operations for Blount disease are not a lot of fun. So if you do the lateral physiodesis, then at least you know where you stand and everybody knows what to expect. The problem with the physiolysis is nobody knows quite what to expect. Not you, not the parents, not the patients, and everybody's just crossing their fingers. So great in theory, but not so great. My point is, once you get to stage four of the disease, then you have to think about some sort of management of the physis or you're going to get recurrence for sure. What about these later stages? These are the stages where you're either getting a bifid type epiphysis or actually a definite physeal arrest on the medial side. Well here again osteotomy is going to be part of your procedure for sure. You're going to have to manage the problem of the physis and that's probably going to be, because these are older children, that's almost certainly going to be a physiodesis, actually, an epiphysiodesis. You're going to deliberately destroy the lateral side of the, of the growth plate to stop the disease coming back. But you need to think how sloped that um, tibial plateau is now. How congruent do you think the joint actually is? You need to at least ask the question whether you think the knee joint is, is congruent or whether... Um, there has been essentially a collapse of the medial tibial plateau. So any patient who's walking with that varus thrust that I mentioned, particularly older patients, that's rather suggestive that they have a problem with a joint that is no longer congruent. Um, however, bear in mind what I said about those abnormalities of ossification, and I showed you that MRI scan. So it ain't necessarily so. Even with an x-ray that looks like this, it might be that the joint is more congruent than you think. So before you get too excited about doing some very clever operations to try and restore the joint surface, you would do well to do an MRI and or an arthrogram just to prove to yourself that there is a genuine gap on this medial side and that it's not either filled up with un as yet unossified epiphysis or a large fleshy uh, hypertrophied um, meniscus, which is the other thing that can actually lead to the joint being more congruent than you think. If you have evidence that the joint is not congruent, in fact, then you're probably wise to get a CT done and 3D reconstructions are really helpful so that you can make a plan about how to go about addressing this problem of restoring congruity to the joint. But the basic principle is this. What you're trying to do is to restore congruity by an osteotomy 
directed with a curved osteotome from the medial side until the intercondylar area, and then you deliberately crack it and elevate this half of the joint, which does take some bravery to do, I can tell you. But this is how you restore the joint congruity. You get rid of that space that was there before. Of course, you're now gonna to have to fill up this gap or it's gonna collapse again. So you're going to put a bone graft in there, which you've harvested from the fibula usually. And that restores the congruity, but the disease is gonna come back unless you do something about this lateral um, physis, which is still active. So you'd better make sure you do an epiphysiodesis as well. And then finally, you need to realign the tibia. So you're gonna do a tibial osteotomy and realign it. Then you've got to fix the whole thing together. And that's up to you how you do it. You could use an external fixator, you could use internal fixation. The choice is yours. So infantile blount disease, this is a summary um, by Lang and Scold stage. So essentially stage four is the stage where you need to start thinking about management of the physis in addition to just doing a tibial osteotomy. And once you get to the later stages, you need to consider whether a hemi-plateau elevation is necessary. So you can see how complicated infantile blount disease is to treat. Did I not say at the start, whenever you see a young child who's got a permanent physial arrest, you know you're heading for trouble. You know that that's going to be a difficult problem to sort. Adolescent blount disease is a different beast entirely. It shares a name but arguable whether it's the same pathology at all. So this is a condition that occurs in children older than 10, and importantly, they have no previous history of bow legs as a child. They most, in my experience, most of these 10-year-olds actually look more like they're 15 or 16, so they do seem to be skeletally advanced. And they too are complaining of genuvarum, which is progressive. Um, these are all obese kids, all of them, and their disease is usually unilateral, which does seem a little strange, because the obesity is certainly not unilateral, but that's the way it goes. Um, you will know that you're dealing with adolescent blount disease instantly from the x-ray because they look totally different to the infantile form that I've just shown you. But bear in mind that you are going to get adolescents, as I said at the start of the talk, who have bow legs, but who have the infantile form which has recurred, but they look quite different on the x-ray. So here on the left-hand side of the screen, this is what you typically see in an adolescent with that form of a disease. So you can see this sort of pagoda roof to the tibia. You can see signs of previous tibial osteotomies and the degree of varus is really quite marked. What you see in the adolescent form of the disease is a more mild form of varus. And look at the physis here. We're not seeing that advanced uh, medial physial arrest. In fact, if anything, what you're seeing is an aphysis that looks apparently wider. I don't think it really is wider. I think, again, it's a defect of ossification. But you're not seeing those advanced medial changes that you see in the infantile form of the disease. There's no physial bar here. It looks much more normal. The physis is basically a lot less sick in this condition, and that's a good thing. That makes it easier to treat. One other thing, one typical feature of adolescent blount disease is said to be that it also includes some of the varus coming not just from the tibia, but from the femur as well. That's a real favorite question for the FRCS author, so worth noting that. Femoral varus is present in adolescent blount disease, but is said not to occur in infantile blount disease. So if we say that the growth plate is not sick, then that's really helpful, right? So if this patient still has some growth remaining, then there's no reason why we can't go ahead and treat that by a guided growth regime. So that's what's happened in this case. Some eight plates have been inserted to try and slow up the growth on the lateral side and hey presto, the whole situation has been rescued. One of the problems with eight plates can be in these rather heavy children that they can break. So it's worth considering designs of eight plates called H plates which take four screws, not two. And those are said to have a lower chance of the implant failing. What about if the patient's already skeletally mature and growth plate and guided growth is not gonna work for you and you're gonna to have to do a realignment osteotomy, but at least you can do that confident 
that you can uh, realign it and be sure that recurrence will not recur, but the, the disease will not recur, right? Because they're skeletally mature. So you don't need to worry about all of that stuff to do with physeal management and physiodesis and physiolysis. You just need to realign it. How you realign it, that's up to you. If internal fixation is your thing, then go ahead. But the real problem with these kids is they are so large that physically doing that on table can be quite difficult, especially knowing that you've absolutely got it right. Because if you're going to go for acute um, correction and internal fixation, you'd better make sure you've corrected it properly before you let them out of the operating theatre. So you might instead go for external fixation, um, which has some advantages and disadvantages. If you know how to use external fixators, it's quite nice because you don't have to get the correction done in theater, you can do it later on. And you've got a choice. You can either make the mechanical axis completely normal or you can match it to the other leg, which is often slightly various anyway, it depends what you're trying to achieve. Um, I'm also concerned about doing acute osteotomies in the proximal tibia. In some series, there are rates of neurovascular comp compromise and, and um, compartment syndrome of, of eye-watering proportions. So you don't tend to get that with external fixation. I do accept, however, that these patients do run into trouble with pin site infection, and they're also condemned to wearing them for at least three months. It does take quite a time to unite. But anyway, it's up to you how you treat it. But osteotomy is your way forward if this is adolescent lout disease in a patient who is skeletally mature. So just to summarize about Blount disease then, this is a, as has been well described as a bimodal disease with an infantile and, and an adolescent form. The infantile one is, is difficult to treat because the physis is sick and your challenge is always gonna be that the disease wants to come back. It's a recurrent disease. The adolescent form on the other hand is much more simple to treat because the physis is not so sick, but there your challenge is a technical one because of the size of the patients. And if you remember no more numbers from this talk than the number four, that, that would be a good start. So in infantile blount disease, get the osteotomy done by age four to reduce the chance of recurrence. And re remember that after the Langenskold stage four, you need to start seriously thinking about physeal management. So this table just summarizes some of the key features which are different in these two forms of the disease. Um, this is a 12 year old girl who had had Blount disease treated in the past. So she'd had the infantile form, she'd had it from an early age and sure enough, the disease had recurred. So here she was at 12. She has all the features you can see from the soft tissue shadows that she was a, a big girl and she had recurrent disease with various internal tibial torsion, uh, procovatum. So she, she had a sagittal plane deformity as well but I didn't think of Vera's thrust. I thought despite those appearances, she, her knee was actually fairly congruent. So what do I want to do? Well, I need to do an osteotomy to realign it and I need to manage the physis as well. So I need to do, I thought, a physiothesis. I wanted to deliberately drill out the physis on the lateral side to stop it coming back. So that's what I did. I, I didn't fancy acute correction. I'm scared of the neurovascular compromise that can occur with that so I put on an external fixator and we corrected it okay great on to a winner or so I thought but this is what she looked like when we'd finished so what had happened here well in my defense you can see the solution and when you put external fixators on people it's quite difficult to get them to stand up and take radiographs sometimes so I was rather disappointed to see this and my mistake had been that we'd actually corrected the tibia pretty well, as you can see. But what I had not appreciated was the pretty marked femoral deformity that she had in addition. Now, the books tell you that femoral deformity does not occur in infantile blount disease. Well, I'm here to tell you that it does, but it's not varus generally, it's usually valgus, as in this case. And um, my ex-colleague, Rob Hill, he believes that this femoral deformity only tends to occur in infantile blount disease that's already been treated. So maybe it's in the arthrogenic deformity in some way. I don't think he ever wrote that up. I haven't seen it written up, but that's, that's my point. So I suppose 
well, what are we going to do about this? Well, I'm not so worried about doing acute osteotomies in the distal femur. So that's what we did. We corrected it using um, a, a, an acute correction, taking out a medial wedge and fixing with a locking plate. And that, that sorted out the mechanical axis. You can see on the right hand side, we've got a few fun and games to deal with, but that's, that's probably something for another talk. So point is that um, with any deformity, you always have to think about a compensatory deformity, which the body has desperately tried to put in place in order to compensate for the first one. And I think that's what happened here. Well, at least it's an honest case example, huh? So um, the final bit that I wanted to give you was, was some tips for dealing with Blount disease, either in clinical practice or if you meet one of these cases in the FRCS auth. But again, we can pause at this point and go to questions if, if you'd prefer for us. What, how do you think we should play it? I think it would be very useful to uh, hear your tips. We could do that okay. after questions as well. Um, so if you like, we, we, and then we'll hear your tips. That'd be very nice. Okay. So I, I'd really like to thank you, uh, Gavin, for this uh, wonderful teaching lecture. We certainly have learned a lot. Uh, a lot of very important concepts you presented. And uh, I mean, one of them, um, for those going for the FRCS exam, I think when you presented the blind disease picture, clinical scenario, uh, you know, reach to your pen straight away and try to draw that Selenius graph. Um, that would be one of the important marking points for that station. And it's yeah. important uh, that I heard about the deformity, that it's actually 3D deformity, and we tend to look at it in the one plane, uh, but as you explained, it's a 3D deformity, and we have to consider all the deformities there. Um, yep. And it's very interesting also to know uh, that ado adolescent uh, blunt disease is completely different pathology to the infantile one. Uh, and that, that's, uh, I thought that's just a new, new for me and very, very important point to um, take into account. So, you know, so many, for so many uh, key points you presented, which are very useful. Um, just there have been some questions from the audience. Um, th there is some controversy about uh, the early walker. Uh, is that important to know? And what exactly defines an early walker? Is it, you know, independently walking or standing or, or is it not essential to? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure the, the books are ever that clear about it. But basically, I think we mean any child who's um, walking before the age of one. So once you hear that a child is walking by the age of sort of nine, ten, 11 months, that, that should ring alarm bells. Often, actually, these children do, do need to be helped at this point. You know, they have to have their hands held. But children that want to spend most of their time up, you know, taking weight on their two legs at that time, those would count as early walkers. And uh, one more question is that about the overcorrection. Um, is there any guidance on how many degrees you overcorrect or is that age, age uh, related? Yeah. So um, the overcorrection only refers to infantile blount disease. Yeah. You shouldn't overcorrect the adolescent cases because they don't have any growth left. So the, the guidance is, yeah, it's, it's not a big overcorrection. It's just, you know, five degrees, I would have thought. You won't want to do more than that. Because after all, how, you, what are we saying here? We're saying that we know that there's a chance of recurrence and we're hoping that if we can just tweak it a little bit the other way, then then hopefully we'll get away with it and the physis will get the chance to remodel and recover. But equally, you, you, you do want some recurrence, right? You don't want to leave this child with, with uh, a leg that is now in valgus. So you don't want to overcook it. I would say about five degrees should do it. Thank you. Thank you for explaining. Uh, obviously, uh, that's, we don't want to overcorrect in adolescent form. Uh, that would be a mistake. Um, sure. Just about the follow-up also, do you follow up these until they're fully skeletally, skeletally mature or um, beyond that? Or um, So I, I guess the answer to that is um, I tend to put the onus on the parents and I explain that, that the big problem with this disease is recurrence and that if parents see that happening, then they should, um, they should get back in touch with us. It depends how busy your clinics are. I think the important point is whether you decide to follow them up or just put the onus on the parents, you should always advise the children and their families that recurrence is a distinct possibility. Because if you don't, then 
their parents are going to find that quite hard to forgive and you're going to be backtracking and making trying to make a few excuses for yourself whereas if you told them that recurrence is likely and it happens then they're likely to trust you they, they you come across as being a wise old sage who made a good prediction and that's going to be important if you're going to be treating them again so uh, it's a communication skill also here isn't right. it? As, uh, right. um, and just uh, one more question uh, before we put the polling questions to everyone to answer um, any, you said the compartment syndrome is one of the complications. Uh, is there any tips on how to prevent it or? Um... Oh, yes. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for mentioning that. I should have done. So if you I'm not a big fan of doing acute corrections, but if you are going to do that, then it makes sense to do a prophylactic uh, fasciotomy, certainly of the anterior compartment. So that's done subcutaneously. So through the incision that you use to do the osteotomy, you um, split the fascia longitudinally up and down, and that reduces the chance. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, there was just a couple of other questions on the chat group. Sorry for asking. Yeah, Martin, um, in terms of the epiphysis uh, or epiphysis, is there a um, is there a knockoff point when you would do it in terms of the bar size? Um, would the bar size change? Oh, right. Yeah, good. Good question. Um, I don't think there is in in terms of the size of the bar. Generally, removing physeal bars is said to be better. Um, if, if they're peripheral. So you would think that Blount's disease would do well, right? Because this is a peripheral bar, not a central one. What is important, I think, is the stage of the disease. So by the time you've got to stage five and stage six, then there's no point in excising the bar. You, you would be better just doing a growth arrest on the lateral side. The, the problem with, with excising physeal bars, I think, is, is having the courage to keep on nibbling it and going further and further laterally as you're creating a bigger and bigger cavity under the joint. And I think most surgeons kind of lose their nerve and that might be one of the reasons why we don't get such good results from it. So I can't, no, there's no, there's no firm advice on the size of the bar. It's more on the stage of the disease. So it's, a, it's an option for stage four, but I would say not for stage five. And uh, in terms of osteotomy, where would you cut the fibula? Um... Uh, the fibula, yeah, I, I tend to cut that um, right about the junction of the um, distal third and the proximal two thirds. So it doesn't really matter. You can cut it wherever, but out of the way of the common perineal nerve is a good idea. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Schwan, for putting forward those questions. Um, now, guys, um, participants, I'm going to put the polls, uh, the questions now. I will give you, I will give you a, a minute or two to answer them. Uh, they, they are all anonymized, so you're not identified, and these are really just to consolidate your uh, knowledge, and they are very important bits that uh, can uh, pop in the exam. So uh, have a look, guys, and, and if you could answer them as quick as you can. The quicker, the quicker you guys answer these questions, uh, the quicker we can uh, move on to the next section. Yeah. Um, uh, can I ask another question that was being asked in terms of uh, in terms of uh, adolescent blunts and uh, probably infantile in terms of uh, sorry in adolescent blunts my apologies um, do you do a femoral osteotomy as your primary part of your treatment in those patients when if you spot uh, a problem there um, yeah the, the answer is you'd certainly need to address the femoral deformity but you um, it depends if they're skeletally mature or not. Guided growth will also work for the femoral deformity. That's what I showed in the slide, actually. There were eight plates, both on the femur and on the tibia. So yes, the answer is you, you definitely need to address that as well. And just a reminder, after uh, this MCQ se uh, se se section, we will move on to the hot seat driver. The hot seat driver session is not recorded, obviously. Uh, and we thank everyone who comes forward. Uh, we know it's not easy to be on the hot seat in front of uh, so many people, but it's very good opportunity and learning experience uh, from an experienced uh, lecturer and teacher uh, with lots of experience with the FRCS exam. So uh, well done, everyone who raised their hands and um, everyone else will benefit from listening and from uh, hearing the feedback. So I think 73% uh, of participants now answer. So I think I'll end the polling now, 75% answer. Um, 
Question number one, infantile blind disease associated with, and option number two uh, is the correct one. Uh, worst prognosis in Afro-Caribbean patients. So 65% answered this correctly. Question number two, adolescent uh, blind disease. And the correct answer is number two again, is commonly unilateral. 76% answered this correctly. Question number three, the answers were a bit more interesting. So in regards to uh, Langeskjold staging blind disease, which one of the following statements is true? Uh, only 41% said the correct answer, which is uh, the answer number two. Stage three, the physical changes are potentially reversible with tibial osteotomy alone. So, so here are my tips for, for dealing with blount disease if you're in a viva situation. You may get shown an image um, of blount disease. I showed you the typical radiographic images and actually it backs up a point Faraz just made that the appearances are very characteristic with blount disease. So there's really nothing else that could be. So my advice is don't hedge, don't mention other conditions that you think it might be. Don't mention things like um, that it could be due to rickets. Go in there and say it's blount disease. But now here's, here's the next really important point. There is a feeling that if I'm not talking, I'm not scoring. And I have to say, as uh, my experience has been, that's not always a very good approach in a viva. So if you're asked to describe the appearances of an X-ray and you think that looks like Blount disease, say what you think and say, I see these appearances and the examiner says, what do you think it is? And they say Blount disease. Now, that is the point to stop talking because what many people do is say, I think it's Blount disease. There are two forms of Blount disease, they're adolescent and infantile, and it's caused by physical, like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'd strongly advise you to stop at that point because you don't know where the vibe is going. We might start talking about um, the pathogenesis. We might start talking about treatment. We might start talking about differences between adolescents and um, an infantile. You just don't know. So um, it's very important in a viva on Blount disease, and in fact, on any viva, to in an early stage, I would advise you to stop talking and wait and see which way the vibe is going because that's where the points lie. Next point is, well, it's kind of illustrated by what I showed you in that last case example. So if, if, you're, if you have the presence of mind, note the fact there's a tibial deformity there from Blount disease, but just keep your eye on the distal femur as well. For, for those extra points, you could point out, if you see that there's a femoral deformity, then point that out to the examiner too because that's going to look good. They'll be polishing up the gold medal when, when you say that. So what about, about clinical tips? So here, here are my tips. This, this could apply actually in a busy clinic as well as, as well as in the FRCS ortho exam. So when you see a child with Blount disease, don't, don't even bother asking them about pain. They're not going to tell you it's there. It, it, I genuinely think it isn't there, actually. These kids just get on with life. You, you're going to get far more um, credit for asking whether they're bothered by the appearance of their legs and whether it stops them taking part in things. Because that's, that's really what it is in pediatrics. It's, it's all about function. Pain is, is not a feature. Sure, in adults with Blount disease, you can imagine the natural history is, is pretty aggressive. But so don't, don't ask about pain. The varus thrust thing is, is a very typical appearance. It's quite a, a, an acute jerk of the knee every time they take a step. So if you see it, mention it. If you don't see it, don't say that you think it's there because you feel that it ought to be because you know that varus thrust is quite common in Blount disease. Um, the reason I say that is because if you mention it's there, then you'll start to get into a conversation about medial plateaus being elevated and do you think that's a good idea and what about the lateral collateral ligament? You're going to go down a, a pretty tricky route. So by all means, identify it, but don't, don't sort of say that you think it's there just because you think it ought to. Um, another thing for them to get the gold medal out for you is um, it would be quite good to, to examine the patients uh, on the couch and to see if they can apparently get their knees fully extended. Because in Blount disease, it looks like they can't. It looks like they've got a fixed flexion deformity of the knee, but in fact, they haven't. They get their knee fully straight. The reason their knee looks bent is because they've got a proximal tibial deformity. 
So that looks quite good if you demonstrate that to an examiner. It shows that you're aware that this condition is not just genuvarum, but has deformities in other planes as well. While they're on the couch, you could examine for lateral, um, uh, collateral ligament laxity, which might be an indicate, which might confirm your suspicion of a varus thrust. And here's my, my final and most important and favorite tip to pass on, and that is you should always examine patients with coronal, any coronal plane deformity with their kneecaps pointing forward. And why? I'll show you why. So here is how most children with Blount disease, and this is one, tend to uh, stand. And actually, this is also how radiographers tend to position them when they're taking their x-rays for you. Because it's, it's easier for the patient, isn't it, with their feet pointing forward. But look where his kneecaps are. That left patella is externally rotated. If you take the trouble to reposition his leg so that the kneecaps are pointing forward, look what happens. Now you can see the genuvarum, but you can also see the intibial tibial torsion. Not only can you see it, the examiner can see it as well. Incidentally, look at what he's doing now. He's having to hold onto the wall because he feels a bit unstable like that. But that's, do you see the difference? It's, it's, it's such an impressive thing to show an examiner by just taking a moment to re, reposition his foot so his kneecaps are pointing forward. Suddenly the mist clears and you can see much more clearly where the deformities are. So that's everything I have to say on Blount disease. Good luck to everybody in dealing with those patients, either in your clinics or in the exams. And everything that's on my presentation from now on is, is related to Vibers. So that's all I have to say. And thanks very much for inviting me to, to talk on the webinar. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you, Mr. Spence. That's lovely. Uh, very useful tips. I like that last one. I think while examining this patient in the even short case or intermediate case, if you just talk to the examiner, tell them, trying to point the patella forward while examining this patient, I think uh, you know, the examiner will smile and um, they know what you're doing. And, uh, so it's, exactly. Uh, that's lovely. I don't think many people would do that, so I think it's a very useful tip. So, okay, guys, so I'll, thank you very much, uh, Spence. So we'll, we'll move on now to the Viva session, which will be unrecorded.